Hi, I'm Brandon. <laughs> I'm Matt. And I'm Matt. I'm Brennan. And this is Bourbon at the Bench. It tastes better out of this glass. You think so? Don't forget the first sip burns off of your taste buds. Yeah, I already took that. So. Oh, okay, sorry. And uh, okay, it's 2021. It's We've good. got good bourbon, good glasses. And we're talking about tone holes. In these glasses. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to talk about tone holes. Where to begin? Um, tone holes, <laughs> for those that don't know, which maybe not everyone knows this, I don't want to assume anything, are the holes that come out of the saxophone that the pads are covering. Let me see if this will come into the frame. Oh, you got one. Well, here's a bear thing. Yeah, there's a, that's a good one. But, so these... Yeah, the, little, yeah the, the chimneys that are literally pulled out of... Yeah. Of the bio tube. All saxophones have tone holes. That's, uh, <laughs> tone holes are, you know, where the sound comes out, they affect the tone and the intonation. Yeah, um, where the tone hole is located. Yeah, where it's located on the actual tubing on the horn. Um, affects the pitch. So they're, they're a very important part, obviously, of, <laughs> of the instrument. Okay, types of tone holes. We've got drawn tone holes, soldered on tone holes. The drawn tone holes are, I would say, on 99% of saxophone, um, especially anything newer. That's how they are going to do it at the factory. Oh, there's one other type of tone hole. Rolled. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to get there, but. <laughs> what do you have there? Uh, well, this is a Martin Elto. These are soldered on, um, and they're, they're a unique shape on this horn, but um, I think it's more unique that they're soldered on. Yeah. I don't think any modern makers do that, do they? No, not that I know of. Martin's the one that, that pioneered it, I guess. Um, so they cut a, a crazy shape hole into the body tube or the bell or whatever. They cut the, like an oblong hole and then they fashion a chimney that has the same shape. It's much more complicated than I'm making it sound. And you just solder it on and that's it. What are your thoughts on soldered on tone holes? Pros and cons? A pro could be <laughs> that. <laughs> They're a little bit stronger, maybe. Um, these te these are actually very thick. Right? Yeah, they're very thick walled usually, and there's a little bevel at the top. Yeah. Um, right. So maybe they're a bit stronger, and maybe um, maybe not as messed up. But I haven't checked. I in my in my limited Martin experience, they seem to be closer to flat, yeah. right out of the box, than non soldered tone holes and i think it's because they're machined separately and yeah. they're thicker um so like where some where some thin non-soldered tone holes you know you check them and they're the the checker is rocking across it. i don't find that as often on the martin tone holes so that's like one pro for sure but i think the cons severely outweigh the pros yeah i mean the biggest con is if the solder joint breaks, you have a huge leak. Yeah. And it's actually part of like the foundation of the instrument. It's not just a pad leak. So right. the only other horn that I have seen, I think, with soldered on tone holes was an original Adolf Sachs. Oh, sure. Yeah, I think Martin is one of the only companies that really did it. And then, like you said, stencils of martin which a stencil is a basically a copy under another name yeah. we should talk to you about so we talked about how solder tone holes are made essentially yes. we should talk about how drawn tone holes are made um okay. i got to see them doing this at the con selmer factory in elkhart indiana they don't make saxophones in the united states anymore anywhere um at least not from scratch. Um, but I watched them making a flute 
and it's the same procedure, just, just on a different instrument. So what they do is they cut again, an oblong hole into the tube of the instrument. And then they insert, there's a, a ball, I think it's, a, or maybe a barrel, I don't know, a round object inside the instrument that's larger than the hole that they cut into it. And then they thread in a rod to that round object and they pull it through the oblong hole and it stretches the brass out to give us um, what we have on modern saxophone. So there's no solder around the edge of the tone hole itself. It's pulled out of the brass. And then it's, it is in no way a flat surface when they do that. So then they come down with a machine that has a spinning blade essentially on it that trims down the excess brass and you're left with a marginally flat surface after the fact. Yeah. So it's the same procedure. It's drawn out, but then instead of a blade that comes down, it's a, I don't know exactly how the tool works, but it rolls over the edge of the brass chimney that was just pulled out. So you yeah. get a nice round, smooth surface. Otherwise, same procedure as standard drawn tone holes. Yeah, it's, I, yeah, it just like rolls the edge up on itself. We should also mention every woodwind instrument has tone holes, but yes. since this is a saxophone channel, we're gonna stick this. Oh, still got it. So much. <laughs> and that will never happen again on this channel. Um, <laughs> Sorry for all those people that came here only to talk about saxophones. Yeah, so I guess really, if you want to classify it that way, there are three types of tone holes. Yeah. Drawn, uh, rolled, and then soldered on. The drawn and the rolled are sort of made in the same process. Just one separate step at the end. So why are we specifically talking about them today? Why do they matter to us, the repair people? I think for us, especially in an overhaul, it's important that the tone holes are leveled or as close to level as they possibly can be for a couple of reasons. It, first of all, it makes our job a lot easier when we're installing the new pads. Sure. Because if you think about something coming down onto a level surface, it's gonna sit much easier than on some wavy thing. Also, I always like to stress the point that in leveling the tone holes, it's in my world, I feel like it's also creating a more stable instrument uh, for yeah. the long term. Because if the tone hole itself is an uneven surface, um, like the really bad ones resemble like a hard taco shell or a potato chip. Yeah. When you're trying to get a pad to cover that chimney shape, um, with minimal finger pressure, you have to contort the pad or the key cup in crazy ways to accommodate for the crazy shaped, the uneven surface of the tone hole. And in our experience, I think I can speak for both of us, when you try to accommodate the pad and the key cup to that irregular surface, it might work for the time, uh, but it's when you put that much stress on the pad, bending it in weird ways, um, it wants to go back to its natural flat. So while you can get away with it, it, it does not, in our opinion, seem to be a long lasting, appropriate fix. Right, I agree. So we go through and we make them as flat as we can through a variety of methods. That way the pad doesn't have to contort to any strange shape. It can just come down onto a flat surface, cover it to stop all air from coming out, and you're off to the races to play some giant steps or some uh, mysterious morning. Yes, those are very similar pieces. Those are the only two pieces I know. And yes, they're both pieces. Yes. I think we mentioned this in an earlier episode too, but another, and this is, uh, related but unrelated. Also, when we're doing an overhaul, um, we level the key cup so the the, right. the parts that the pad actually gets glued into also gets leveled because 
most of the time they're not um, because they're they're being bent and um, distorted to compensate even, for even it. straight from the factory that that seems to happen. I mean, I again um, when I was at the factory again not saxophones but other woodwind instruments with the same ideas. No one was heating up. Okay, I'm not saying that they never do, but where I was looking, no one was heating up key cups and and gently poking and shifting pads around. They were taking um, dowels and little devices and hammers and they were knocking the keys around. Yeah. And that is not a bad thing. Um, it's just not the thing that we do during a super professional overhaul. I mean, it's, and it can, I mean, when you, so when you see a Mark six that has original pads and it's still playing, there's no way that all those tone holes are perfectly flat and the pads are perfectly flat and the key cups are perfectly flat. They knocked those things around and then it, and then it worked, but it just, it seems like you're asking for trouble. Yeah, there's no, I feel, I always, I feel there's no way to guarantee the longevity of the work or the playability of the instrument if, if those things are not corrected, basically. Sure. Um, so th that is why, to us, tone holes are one of the most important steps in rebuilding the saxophone yeah it's it's the foundation it's like it's like the foundation of your house if it's not in good shape um it doesn't matter how pretty the hardwood floors are once the foundation starts sinking or you know then everything goes to crap so um the the level tone holes the the mechanical work that we discussed in other another episode all of that is foundation that makes the the pad work and everything last as long as possible how do we do it? I'm just going to say, let's talk about how we do it. Because I think from talking to people over the years, I think there's a lot of um, misconception about what happens when the tone holes are leveled. Yeah. And I mean, it's not all, uh, they're not always wrong. I mean, if someone's really abusive and reckless with it, then sure, they can be, they can get really messed up. I know that you and I and <laughs> um, you know some of our colleagues sure. uh, all take you know extra special care of tone hole leveling. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it's good for us to share some of the techniques that we use when we level the tone holes. We can, we can boil it down to two techniques. Tone hole is uneven. Let me see if there's, if I can make a, I don't think I can do anything with a quick visual. You can look at like from, from the profile, it might look like this. And we want the pad to come down onto the surface and cover it all the way. So in general, from the side, if the tone hole looks like this, you have high spots and low spots. So our two options are either bring down the high spots until it's level, or I guess there's sort of three options, but the two, the two techniques bring down the high spots or bring up the low spots. And the third sort of option is a combination of both, which I think is kind of sort of goes without saying. Um, and people get scared because to bring down the high spots is to remove brass from the instrument. And that can sound very scary. And sometimes in the process, it might look scary. But ultimately, unless there was significant damage to the instrument, you're not removing that much material at all. So if you were to, with a kitchen scale that you or I might have, if you were to weigh the instrument without any of the keys on it, weigh it, and then level all the tone holes by removing material and weigh it again, I guarantee that kitchen scale would not pick up any difference in weight. You would have to have some kind of very impressive um, scientific scale to pick up the difference in weight from the dust that comes off when you're removing material from tone holes. So I know it can sound scary, but it's really not that big of a deal. And we do it all the time. 
and it makes for a better repair. Just to like piggyback on that, uh, I know we both do this. You know, if we get to a tone hall and there's like this huge discrepancy, let's say like a really low spot, yeah, something crazy, then we're going to correct that by, you know, trying to get the low spot as close to the high spots before you go and remove uh, material from the high spots. Um, we're, we're, other, otherwise, you would you would end up running out of material yeah. if you tried to just remove the high spots until you reach the low spots. You would be going into the body of the instrument. I mean, I've seen that before on um, stuff where yeah. a horn maybe has been overhauled like ten times in its life, you yeah. know, and it's someone just kept drilling, drilling, drilling. Yeah. Um, or whatever, finally somehow. Um, and yeah, then you end up with a tonal that's flush to the body of the instrument, which is not good. And uh, it's also really, really difficult to try to even install a pad then. And yeah. usually the tonal has to be re remade. So, so let's talk about how we remove material from tone holes and and then we can talk about how to do the opposites and when or how you know when to do one or the other <clears throat> so i guess there are two ways two methods very related but similar uh, but different um, methods of removing brass from tone holes two. There, yeah the old school way and the new school way What's the old school way? The old school way. I don't have any on me. Oh, don't say it. Don't say it. I don't have any on me. And no, I have, I no. have, is to just take, and they make these things specifically no. for instrument repair. No. It's a giant flat file, just a big no. metal cross. If children are watching this. <laughs> no, you are not. <laughs> Listen, this is what they used to do. They used to take these no, big right flat now. files and they would just <laughs> until it was flat. Um, Wait, the issue there flat. is, are you putting the same amount of pressure on the front of the file as you are the back of the file? Or So that, that's how they used to do it. And then people started coming up with our now preferred method of removing materials. And that's by using round files where the pressure is coming at it from the middle. Yeah, so it's just a piece of brass cut to the right thickness. And the thickness isn't that important, but the thinner it is, the um, more versatile, you know, it's not gonna bump into other things. And then what, what you and I do is we have a screw going through it, diamond abrasive, it's essentially sandpaper, but it's, but it's a diamond grit. It has this kind of honeycomb yeah. texture to it. Um, and then, so this, this sits on top of the tone hole and you spin it and it removes material just from the high spots to make sure that it stays centered on the tone hole. We have all kinds of pilots. This is a set of every half millimeter size of circle disc. And you pick the size that fits the tone hole you're working on and screw it on there, set it inside the tone hole and spin it. And you can spin it by hand. You can spin it with a big T handle. I bought this on Amazon um, to fit the quarter 20 hex screws you're gonna put through the middle of these things. And you can turn it until, until the tone hole is flat, until you achieve exactly what you're going for. I add a little bit of key oil to the, the diamond grit side, and that actually slows down the cutting um, even more and reduces the amount of burrs that might form. Yeah, um, and it, help, it helps get the, the brass dust away from the cutting area. Yeah. Uh, these are already done. I mean, I've already got keys on, um, so the tone holes, the key work, all of that is done already. But just as an example, um, you pick the the pilot that fits inside the tone hole, 
you pick the file that's just a little bit bigger than the tone hole itself. You lay it on there and then rotate it until, until it's where you want it to be. And you can check it with your leak light. And you flip it over to the non-abrasive side and you lay it on top and make sure there's no light coming out. And you're not gonna be able to see this because it's a webcam, but there's no light coming out. Um, from there, you know, Matt was talking about burrs, which can happen on the inside of the hole or the outside, just a sharp edge. Um, and this sharp edge can grab on the leather of the pad and make it stick or it can rip straight through the leather because it's so sharp and expose the felt underneath the leather and then you've got a whole other problem. And that's something unfortunately that I've seen on brand new instruments that needs addressing. Brand new instruments where the pads are starting to rip because uh, the tone holes can be so sharp. Um, but I mean, for how long it takes you or I to do the tone holes on a saxophone, you can imagine what the cost would be at the manufacturing level if someone sat there by hand doing what we do to tone holes. Uh, Should we talk about raising low spots? Yeah, and this is where we get into a hotly debated subject, not raising tone holes in general, but, um, sorry, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. We raise tone holes on a modern horn like this, but when the tone holes are rolled, it is much more important to do the brass manipulation method over the brass removal method. Um, and, that's, and that's the thing that's kind of hotly debated and we don't need to debate it now. Um, but it, I, I would just say it's much more common. You're gonna spend a lot more time raising low spots on a horn with roll tone holes than you would on a horn that has standard drawn non-rolled tone holes. Would you agree with that? Yes. You're gonna do it on both, but you're probably gonna do it more on the rolled version. Yeah, I think on a newer horn, I don't find myself raising low spots much because they're not that bad usually. Exactly. They're definitely not perfect. Yep. Because we're going for Perfect, but yeah, maybe an older horn that's been through the ringer or something might have more stuff that needs to be raised. But definitely, anytime you come across a horn with rolled tone holes, you find yourself lifting the, the low spots. Or a horn that's been damaged. Yeah. You know, when, you have, when you have a tone hole that got smashed because it got dropped or hit by something. Um, that's a, an obvious, situation where you can't just remove material until it's flat or you'd run out of material when there's one right. significant body damage. So how do we do it? How do we raise the low spots? And I think there are two methods. You said that last time. Well, um. <laughs> the slightly less obvious one is to approach it like you're doing dent work and, okay. and put a ball or a barrel okay. inside the saxophone attached to a rod and pushing up from underneath, which is, it's certainly doable, um, but it's not the finest version of the, of the method. It's kind of a, a larger, so again, I, I think it's probably most common with damage. Um, when something's really pressed down, you can go in with a steel ball from underneath and push it back up. Yeah. that's the that's it is technically a method it's probably the, it's yeah, the I, I have done that yeah I, it's not as controlled exactly right it's you're moving large amounts of material um you're not 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 the fine movement that we typically do in a non-damaged overhaul situation i guess so the the other method and probably more common mm -hmm is to use dun, 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 tone hole lifters. I happen to make these and sell them, but that's not why we're talking about it. I didn't invent these, people have sold them. Uh, the ones that you can buy 
typically are made out of steel and they look something like this. It's a little half circle shape that has a, a large diameter side and a small diameter side and a cutout in the middle. And you drop it inside the tone hole, positioning it wherever you need to so that you can come in with some kind of something, some kind of hand tool and pry against the lifter, against the plastic or steel, whatever you're using, against this piece and you're prying up on the low spots of the brass. And I'll either use this, I made this, this is just a, a steel rod that's smooth and I've made a plastic handle for it or something like this, a hand burnisher that's often used for rubbing out dents. Um, you can, it also has a, a nice curve that you can pry up in very specific locations to raise the low spots. So I think when we we're addressing tone holes, our first goal is always to try to work with what's there and get things as close to level before we go to using the files. Even though it only does remove a small, small, small amount of material, we don't really want to remove. remove more than, yeah, more than is necessary, that's for right. sure. You can't so, put it back. You can't put it back, you know, without some crazy amount of work. So, sure. like I said earlier, I've heard a lot of people like fear leveling the tone holes, but I think it's because some of the the first steps and checks and that kind of stuff aren't happening, and you just they just are gone at with reckless abandon, and you can't go back. So. Um, yeah, I, there have been a number of times that I've seen a horn for repair, whether it was for basic repair or for a complete overhaul, where it's clear that somebody went to town on the tone holes previously, and there's almost no tone hole left. And then the pad is trying to cover, uh, you know, sort of something that's not there. Other times I've seen super messed up tone holes or really low tone holes is on relacquered horns, especially like sure. poorly relacquered horns. Yep. Because when they take it, you know, grind it into the buffing wheel. Yeah, in the process of removing the old lacquer, yeah. they, have, they buff. And buffing does a great job of removing lacquer, but it also does a great job of removing brass. Yes. And so that's a whole nother thing. But that is another time I've seen really messed up tone holes um, and really low tone holes. Removing high spots, raising low spots. Okay, so real quick about rolled tone holes. The only reason it's hotly debated, the amount, the, the thickness of the wall of the brass that is rolled over is the same thickness as the edge of the tone hole. It's just the same amount of brass, but rolled over the edges. So you can imagine that if you were to just use a tone hole file on the, ra the rounded rolled tone hole, if you were to just use a tone hole file, before long, you will go through the brass and create a small hole, it's, which is why there are plenty of people out there that will tell you the only thing you should ever do to roll tone holes is raise the low spots. Or we haven't talked about this yet, tap down the high spots, which is an option. But the truth is you can also file them a little bit. Again, kind of like we're saying, get it as close as possible with uh, m moving the material and then remove a tiny bit of material to get at that last few percent. Yeah, that's what I do with rolled tone holes because like we said in the beginning, it, it makes such a huge difference for the stability of the instrument and the work that we're doing. I, I see no point in you know getting a tone hole half leveled or not even leveling it at all and throwing in a brand new eight dollar pad you know and then sending you on your way it's like that's so and yeah. then you have all these problems with it that i tell people um all the time that it's kind of like putting brand new 900 hundred dollar tires on your car but not fixing the alignment first. 
Yeah. And then you end up ruining those tires. Just not exactly the same. You're not going to ruin pads because of a, but it's, it's the same. It's again, it's the foundation. <laughs> Next time we'll talk about key fitting and mechanical restoration. If you want to stay up to date with all things saxophone repair, make sure to like and subscribe. Okay, so that is... That's the end of the episode. Thanks for coming. Now you know everything about tone holes. And uh, tune in next time. We're going to talk about flutes. <laughs> the first time I ever had whistle pig, half of the bottle was gone before I realized how expensive it was. Yeah. I think uh, halfway through the bottle, um, I was like, Drowning in whistle pig at our bootleg hotel repair shop. Yes. And I was like, man, Matt, this is really good. And he said, well, it better be for $80 a bottle. <laughs> and I almost spit. So my mother in law, affectionately referred to as Gil, got me this for Christmas because she saw it on our show here. Oh my gosh, that's why I have these glasses because my dad saw them on our show. Isn't that's something. We're influencers. We're influencers. And my mom got me for my birthday a bourbon nosing kit. Oh my gosh. And it's it's filled with all of the things that you may or may not notice in your bourbon. Damn.